Welcome to episode three of the Mitchell Institute Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Retired John Slickbaum, your host. Our podcast series is designed to explore how we fight in air and space, introducing you, the listener, to the men and women who make it happen. So to kick off this episode, I'd like you to listen to an important statement from longtime defense expert Dave Achmanik. In our games, when we fight China or Russia, blue gets it handed to it. Not to put too fine a point on it. We lose a lot of people. We lose a lot of equipment. We usually fail to achieve our objective of, of preventing aggression by the adversary. That is quite a statement and not one many Americans would expect. The notion that we're so vulnerable when it comes to future conflict. In many ways, it sounds closer to how U.S. forces were postured during the attack at Pearl Harbor, not how we would think of ourselves today. But you know what? Dave Achmanik is right. Our military forces are vulnerable, and it's time that we get busy resetting our strategies, capabilities, and operational concepts to ensure this nightmare scenario doesn't happen. We grew complacent over the 30 years since the end of the Cold War, and it's time to reset. Aerospace power will be crucial as a part of this process. Today, we're going to look at the broader strategic environment. Things like combat aircraft and national security space constellations don't exist for their own purposes. They speak to a need. There are countries and groups who seek to challenge the United States as a nation and our citizen safety and our collective interests around the world. I'm here to tell you, flying air shows as a Thunderbird was an incredible experience, but it's not why we have the United States Air Force nor do we have military assets in orbit to celebrate the wonder of space. It all comes down to the mission of deterring conflict, favorably shaping engagements against adversaries, reassuring our allies, and winning decisively when war comes. That takes smart combat power, of which air and space options are crucial. Since the end of the Cold War, America has enjoyed a dominant position in the global security environment. We lacked major competitors, and we were enjoying a tremendous technological advantage. While the attacks on 9-11 were terrible, they did not pose an existential threat to the country. Now, fast forward to today, and it's clear things have changed. The world is a far more dangerous place. This was not an overnight development. It was a slow evolution, and it was one in which we failed to observe to see what our adversaries were doing. This episode will explain these circumstances, baseline where we sit today, and explore what we need to do about it. Smart military power doesn't shoot randomly. It doesn't try to solve the impossible or occupy territory with no clear purpose. It all comes down to focusing on what we really want to achieve as a nation and figuring out how to net that objective as prudently as possible. This sort of thinking, one centering around smart strategy, empowered by the right set of capabilities and sufficient capacity is what we need looking to future challenges. It is also crucial to have clear objectives in a defined definition of success. This is totally opposite of how we engage for the past two decades in Afghanistan and Iraq. And let's be honest, the results show. Tomorrow's adversaries will be far more challenging than what we've been facing as of late, and it's time to get serious about smart approaches to national security. Performing poorly in Afghanistan and Iraq was tragic and it hurt on so many levels, but repeating a lackluster effort against the likes of China, Russia, Iran, or North Korea could prove catastrophic. So without further ado, let's dig into today's national security picture understand the state of play, and figure out how we can engage to win by being smart. Now, if you want to understand today's threat environment, like the decision makers in Washington, D.C., the leaders who will guide the security enterprise, you need to focus on the National Defense Strategy, or NDS. This document provides the intellectual underpinnings that govern all things related to the military services, related agencies, and combatant commands. Congress requires the Department of Defense to update the NDS every four years. So to understand current strategy, budget decisions, operational concepts, or technological investment, the compass should always point back to the NDS. A defense assessment needs to begin by defining the threat. That is the problem statement. You can't have a prudent solution without knowing what you want to fix. So today, that's generally known as a phrase termed four plus one, with a four being 
China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, and the plus one being violent extremism. That's groups like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Boko Haram, and the others that you hear in the headlines. While unexpected threats could easily emerge, the four plus one concept generally speaks to what it will take to project effective power across a range of plausible options. The idea is to be flexible because we don't do too well predicting the future. It all comes down to having sufficient capacity and capabilities to manage the unexpected. Now, looking at history, whether we're discussing the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the Soviet blockade of West Berlin, 1970 Iranian revolution, or the attacks on 9-11, it's clear to say that the U.S. is really bad at predicting what threats will pop up versus what it's prepared for. So learning from that, smart leaders need to keep their response options open. What makes today's national defense strategy so different from the past is the deliberate focus on a peer competition with a rising China and resurgent Russia. This was a huge change for the defense community, especially after years worth of focus on places like Afghanistan and Iraq. It was also a decision that many argued should have occurred earlier. If things go bad in Afghanistan, it's unfortunate. If we lose against China, it's catastrophic in the most extreme form of the word. We haven't had to think like that since the Cold War. Another key factor that makes things complex is all of these threats are converging at the same time in many different ways. All of these actors have something in common. They need to be understood and proactively managed in the most effective and efficient way possible. To better understand the policy options for each group, we must first understand the actors better. To understand the threat landscape we face, we have a very special guest with us, former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Dr. Jim Miller. In that role, he serves as a principal civilian advisor to the Secretary of Defense on strategy, policy, and operations. He worked to strengthen relations with allies and partners in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, and also to reduce the risk of miscommunication with Russia and China. Also joining me on this conversation is Mitchell Institute's Director of Research, Major General Retired Larry Stutzream. We call him Stutz. He grew up as a fighter pilot flying everything from the F-4 Phantom to the F-16 and the A-10. In Stutz's senior assignments, he advised the Air Force Chief of Staff, he was a military liaison to the Department of State, and he wrapped up his career as a senior leader at Northern Command. Dr. Miller, you've observed the national security environment from numerous stakeholder vantages, and the insights this affords you is second to none. Now, we began this podcast walking our listeners through the way in which the 2018 National Defense Strategy batches the security environment. We've got peer competitors on top, mid-tier threats, and then the non-state actors at the bottom of the stack. How can we address these threats all at the same time, and is there a difference between these threats? So to kick things off, can you tell us more about these threats? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's a big challenge because it is hard for an institution, even a, as large and diverse an institution as the Department of Defense, to focus on multiple challenges at one time. And the reality is that each country has a multi-layered challenge. And maybe I'll, I'll just speak to, to China and Russia, and you can tell me if you want to go from there. Uh, working from the top, if you will, the higher end of conflict or uh, military competition, uh, both Russia and China have substantial nuclear arsenals. So getting nuclear deterrence right is fundamentally important. We're talking about the lives of tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of people. Second layer is conventional deterrence. Uh, both of those uh, great powers, China and Russia, threaten their neighbors uh, and can do so with conventional forces, including uh, irregular forces, such as we saw uh, Russia deploy in Crimea. And so uh, we, we think of that as a less impactful case than nuclear conflict. But as we saw in World War II, conventional war can kill millions of people, set back economies, have massive costs. So getting that deterrence equation right is fundamentally important. Third, both are engaged below the level of armed conflict, particularly in cyberspace, but more broadly, in undermining U.S. interests and trying to create a world safe for authoritarian governments. That's fundamentally important competition. The military plays an important role. And fourth, for China, uh, uh, much more than for, for Russia, we're in a long-term economic and political competition uh, where China's trying to show that their form of government, their form of authoritarianism with market characteristics uh, is a superior model to the United States. And the winner of this competition will have 
not just the other countries that will bandwagon with them, but it will determine the institutional order and the terms of trade and the terms of political discourse for the globe for decades to come. So it is fundamentally important as well. And the role that the department plays is a supporting role. But as we saw in the 2018, 2020 elections with US Cybercom taking down Russia troll farms and so on, it's a fundamentally important role even at, at that level as well. All right. Well, I also have uh, Major General uh, Larry Sutrium with us today. So I know he is uh, itching to ask you the next question here. Great. Great. Go ahead, Stats. Hey, Dr. Miller, I, I, very simply, how do you prioritize these bins of threats we've discussed? I mean, is there uh, one that's worse than the other? Uh, do we strategize to address them all at the same time equally? How would how do you look at those priorities? It's a great question. And as you know, there's a force planning construct that attempts to prioritize those within the department. But I'd say two things. Um, one is no one else is going to provide for our national defense. We are engaged in helping others provide for their national defense as, as a leading power. But uh, what that means is that we need to take care of nuclear deterrence. We need to take care of missile defense vis-a-vis -vis North Korea and Iran. And we need to prioritize those because those are foundational to, to our security and defense. And, and because if we are not secure at home, we are not a reliable ally or partner abroad. If, so that's thing number one. Those, those, those aspects of homeland defense, uh, especially from nuclear threats, have to be, in my view, priority number one. And second, we need to think about not just the potential for conflict, but the long-term competition as well. Uh, in the Cold War, uh, ultimately, we were successful not because we had a bigger country or more people, but because we won the technological competition that gave us advantage militarily, and that drove our economy. That's why the Soviet Union ultimately uh, uh, collapsed. That's why then President Gorbachev determined that their model wasn't going to work. So that means that we need to prioritize the long-term competition with China in particular, and to not just from a military perspective, but more broadly. And it means that the technological competition, uh, which includes AI machine and machine learning, it includes quantum, it includes uh, a range of other IT capabilities uh, uh, with applicability to the military, but also to the economy, it needs to be a very, very high priority for the United States. That's uh, very interesting. Uh, Slick, it's uh, perhaps uh, a topic of a PhD thesis, but uh, if we were to try to understand the motivations of our adversaries, I'd ask Dr. Miller, you know, what drives China? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so the fundamental point to understand about China is that it is not just a rising power, but it is already a great power. And it has a centuries-long history of being the preeminent power in the world that is deeply embedded in their culture and their narrative and how they think about the world. Uh, before the time of the rise of the of the UK and other European powers. For centuries, China was a leading power globally. And this is this is baked into how they think about their proper role in its in the world. And it's baked into how they think about what they should do uh, regionally and globally. So uh, you see uh, their president Xi Jinping establishing objectives that they will be the leading economic power. Uh, they'll be leading technology power. They'll be the leading military power. And they set timelines. And uh, on the whole, uh, Chinese approach to governance, to military development, to economic development is long-term and systematic. And when we read these objectives, we should take them seriously. Uh, it doesn't mean that they, that they intend to have a war to achieve these aims, but it means that they're serious about being the preeminent power and they are willing to do what it takes, uh, and, and, and in essence, to paraphrase Thucydides, uh, 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 great powers do as great powers will, in their view. That's a good and point. And so their theft of intellectual property, which amounts to perhaps one to two percent of the U.S. economy per year of, of, of our, you know, one to two percent of GDP growth per year, uh, is an example of that. Uh, th this is this is a a serious plan, a serious campaign on their effort, and they're undertaking the 
what we would call a whole of government uh, effort to pursue it. So we rank uh, Russia and China in that peer threat or peer adversary group. Is Russia like China or how are they different? How do you see them differently? Yeah, R- Russia and China are extraordinarily different uh, in, in almost every regard. The places where they're similar is that they both have extensive nuclear arsenals. Russia's is much larger, but that means they pose a physical existential threat to the United States. Uh, uh, and they both have substantial conventional militaries that employ so-called gray zone tactics, little green men for Russia, um, uh, so-called Whitehall ships, Coast Guard ships to assert Chinese sovereignty in the South China Sea, for example. But let's rush over to say a few words about that. Uh, its president, Vladimir Putin, believes the U.S. is pursuing regime change in Russia as a fundamental goal of the United States. This is something he believes sincerely, I think. Uh, and it's something that is portrayed to the Russian public as a fact. They believe that we're doing attempting to do that not by military aggression, uh, but by supporting democratic groups uh, and values that threaten the regime internally, and by creeping closer and closer uh, by expanding NATO uh, with U.S. troops near their borders, so they feel closed in. As you all know well, Russia has been invaded multiple times, uh, including by Napoleon and Hitler, and they've paid a terrible price. And one lesson they have is that they need a buffer zone of weak states. I'm sure they'd prefer to have allies, but no rational leader of another country would ally itself uh, with Russia, except under coercion. And so they're trying to stir up challenges in Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova and other countries. Uh, And fundamental part of Vladimir Putin's strategy is to try to bring the U.S. down a notch to tarnish our democracy, to tarnish our international reputation. Uh, And so their intervention in U.S. uh, domestic affairs through social media, through disinformation and so on, is really intended to sow conflict within the United States so that we're weaker and we're less effective uh, globally. And they, they think that's a recipe for their security. It's a dangerous game, but that's where Vladimir Putin is coming from. Right. Uh, So you bring up a key theme when you talk about regime change, Um, just shifting the conversation a little bit, because regime change or just discussing uh, a specific leader seems to be uh, the hot topic when we talk about North Korea and Iran. But I know that there's a lot more uh, beyond just uh, the the face of the leader that we uh, see on the news. Can you dive into what is motivating a North Korea and Iran? Sure. Again, very different. Um, There's no doubt that North Korea's Kim Jong Un is motivated by staying in power at all costs. Uh, And that's not easy to do with a broken economy. Um, And so North Korea's nuclear weapons program, in my view, is intended both to deter the United States from coercing them uh, and to deter South Korea from coercing them uh, and, uh, and to make North Korea a global player and to show its people that their country is a great power and a noble struggle with the United States and the West. So yes, it's their, their nuclear effort is about deterrence in a sense and trying to threaten to impose costs on South Korea or the US if we go too far in pushing them. Uh, uh, but it also, and fundamentally in my view, is aimed at a domestic audience and is part of this narrative of the great leader, the supreme leader, you know, Kim Jong-un is the third in a line of succession. Uh, from his father who took over in 19, or from his grandfather in 1945, and then his father. Now, Iran is, a, is, is somewhat different. It's somewhat analogously to China, but in a, in a more limited way. They believe that they're destined to once again be a great power, as Persia was. Uh, as part of this, they want to spread their brand of Islam, uh, and they want to undermine the Sunni-controlled states like Saudi Arabia and UAE. Uh, and as you know, the conflict and uh, sometimes worse uh, between Shia and Sunni brands of Islam go back centuries. The Iranians also fear that the U.S. is pursuing regime change and something that uh, Secretary of State Pompeo actually kind of said a few months ago. And I think that the reality is that our policy should be to contain Iran, and that includes stopping its nuclear program and blocking its efforts to destabilize the region. And that means sustaining strong relationships with both Israel and the GCC states, as well as a military posture in the Middle East. Uh, Dr. Miller, uh, we look at the uh, third bin, which is, of course, those non-state actors. Uh, The United States is 
suffered some casualties, uh, expended a trillion dollars in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, frankly, uh, those long wars, so-called long wars, may have been from the start unwinnable, but it's been a rocky uh, road. Uh, What lessons do you take out of the past almost 20 years now of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism operations in places like Iraq and Afghanistan that inform what the United States should be doing moving forward with that bin of threat? It's a great question, and I'm going to be pretty direct in my response. First, don't start unnecessary wars. That's the lesson of Iraq. People who are itching for a war with Iran should heed this lesson today and think about the longer term. Number two, have a strategy. No, really, I'm not kidding. (laughs) Uh, That means having reasonable goals. It means giving that strategy the necessary resources and the time to work. Uh, Experience, uh, historical experience shows that about 50% of counterinsurgency works over time and that of those that work, they take a decade or more. Okay, number three. As President Obama said, uh, don't do stupid stuff. Now, that's not a national strategy. It's just, you know, it's a good maxim to live by. Uh, In Iraq, early on, we dissolved the Ba'ath Party and the Iraqi army, uh, and then we failed to fill the void. Uh, In Afghanistan, we decapitated the leadership and failed to have either a political or a security strategy uh, to provide stability and to transition so that the U.S. wasn't holding up the roof. Okay, number four, maybe I'll make it six total. Uh, number four, don't try to impose democracy through regime change. It doesn't work. You've got to think longer term. I think we should promote democracy globally, first and foremost, by being an effective democracy, and secondly, by supporting other democracies, uh, and thirdly, by nudging those who are uh, close to that. Uh, number five, uh, this is going to mix a metaphor, but don't, bri- don't build bridges to nowhere. That's what happened with the Iraqi surge and the Afghan surge. You need a political strategy to uh, to transfer responsibility to these countries. And number six, and it's topical today for both the Trump administration and the Biden administration, is no matter how you got in, get out responsibly. And that means it's going to take time. It's going to take working to build political capacity as well as security capacity of the country. And it means working with our allies and partners. Uh, Dr. Miller, great words there. Uh, I will I will say that... Uh, Lacking a strategy, not doing something stupid is a pretty good strategy. It's a start. <laughs> so you just bring us back to the focus of uh, air and space power being such an influence here. Um, can you describe what uh, air and space or aerospace power meant to you during your time as a defense leader? Sure, sure. Well, the most obvious contribution of air power to folks is the capability for long range strike. And uh, so when I was in the department in the Clinton administration, that manifested itself, for example, in the Operation Allied Force, the air war over Serbia and the Kosovo campaign. Uh, and this involves the ability to hold critical targets at risk to support deterrence or to support other policy or political goals. And I want to just unpack that a little bit because uh, it, uh, it's important to, to think about the elements. First is deterrence by denial. That requires the ability to prevent the adversary from being able to achieve its aims. That means the ability to locate and destroy Chinese ships. It means the ability to locate locate and destroy Russian tanks and armored vehicles. And it means the ability to locate and destroy Iranian or North Korean missiles, all in the context of a so-called anti-access area denial, denial campaign by our adversaries. Second is deterrence by cost imposition. That means the ability to hold at risk what the adversary values, maybe instruments of state control, maybe weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and so we, we need, both of these are provided by air power and it's what people think of first, but let me give you a second category to sort of wrap it up. The second category is that air and space power are critical enablers of not just air force, but joint military operations, global communications, uh, global intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, global mobility, including airlift and refueling. All of these capabilities support the U.S. posture globally and support our ability to lead alliances and to be a great power. 
Dr. Miller, uh, very well said. Uh, but I'm curious, with this extraordinary set of threats uh, facing the United States, I mean, where does capacity fit in? Obviously, uh, we can run out of, as they say, Schlitz uh, pretty quickly if uh, we have multiple uh, contingencies uh, that occur. Uh, how do you see that issue of capacity? My bias today, given where we are uh, uh, with today's threats and today's force structure, is to put the pedal to the metal on quality and, uh, in other words, on capabilities and to uh, pay the bill by reducing the quantity, in other words, the capacity in some areas. And that includes things like uh, uh, ground forces, it includes fourth generation air, and it includes surface vessels for the Navy that aren't going to get anywhere near a fight with China or Russia. So we need to we need to make those changes. But your point is absolutely right. Um, having a couple of exquisite systems is not going to be able to do it. Uh, uh, we, we need to have a substantial enough force to conduct global operations day to day, and a substantial enough force to be able to surge, uh, uh, to be able to defeat armed aggression when it occurs, as well. And uh, it, for a long time, as we, uh, we sized for after the Cold War, we sized for uh, two major theater wars. Realistically, we currently can aspire to have a 1.5, uh, and that means denying one adversary and imposing costs on the other, or at least delaying the other. Uh, we have a long way to go before we could simultaneously deny China and Russia. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a good aspiration, but let's get to the 1.5 first, where we can clearly deny one at a time, and then decide if we want to make the additional hard changes that'll be necessary uh, to be able to deny both and not just impose costs, severe costs on the second. Well, Dr. Miller, we can't say thank you enough for being on our show today and also to Major General Larry Stutzring for being here as well. Thank you both. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Miller. Uh, truly enlightening. Best wishes to you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk with you both. And I very much appreciate all the work that you're doing to make the nation stronger and to bring the message to the American people about how important military capabilities are. Stutz, I don't know about you, but I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to a leader like Jim Miller. I mean, there are certain insights and perspectives that you just won't get until you've sat in the seat and you're the guy that has to make it happen. And Jim Miller has certainly been there. Stutz, you're the other half of this equation. Dr. Miller represents the civilian defense leadership, which as we all know, is the top governance in the Pentagon thanks to the US Constitution. You've spent your time as a military leader, so let's dig into how you would engage this scenario and provide options through the tools of aerospace power. So first off, Stutz, what did you think of Dr. Miller's comments? Well, Slick, he's incredibly eloquent. It was a compact discussion, but he hit all the cloud tops. Let me spotlight a few uh, that are important when we talk about the nation's aerospace power that's resident in the Air Force and Space Force. Uh, first, our adversaries have not stood still. The philosophy of foreign policy that the United States pursued for quite a while, that is called engagement, it really did nothing to sway all three of those bins of threats from building and modernizing their militaries or methods in a way that blunted U.S. military capabilities. Uh, the nation really woke up in the publishing of the 2018 National Defense Strategy that clearly defined these threats we discussed. As far as preparedness, we're way behind, and we need to reshape capability. We need to reshape concepts and capacity. What Dr. Miller describes in terms of the strategic motives of China, Russia, Iran, North Korea in particular, is that they have clear objectives that aren't only uh, ambitious, slick, but they're making great strides in what they want to do. They believe they have a superior course and a superior right, and they're moving out on that path. These countries have worked to develop defenses that completely undercut uh, the American way of war, and we saw that showcased, uh, as you know, slick, in Desert Storm almost 30 years ago, uh, and specifically those defenses are designed to blunt American air power. Dr. Miller also mentioned that the DOD typically can only focus on one major crisis at a time. And there's got to be some far-reaching implications about that. Yeah, it's so true. But it cannot be true in the future. 
uh, the decades that have passed since the end of the Cold War were perhaps challenging, but not as challenging as they will be in the future. We have tended uh, to think really deterministically about our adversaries. What I mean by that is that we can determine and shape their behavior. So, uh, you know, just as an example, when I was directing your operations in both Iraq and Afghanistan at the beginning of Operation Enduring Freedom, I was often shocked at the naivety of planners at CENTCOM who seemed to believe we could just, you know, impose our will uh, in one of the most complex challenges DOD has faced. Uh, our adversaries are not passive. They look for every opportunity. They have that vote. So Dr. Miller said China is the pacing threat. Uh, so, Slick, uh, you know, you and I as warfighters, can we, can we really believe that if we're involved in a major conflict in the Western Pacific, that Russia or an Iran is not going to take advantage of that? I sure would. I know you would, Slick. So, so we need to plan for that. And Stutz, what does that mean for the role of aerospace power? Well, Dr. Miller spoke of deterrence by denial and deterrence by imposing cost. Uh, to do this, leaders must use aerospace power options up front and throughout. The Air Force alone has been assigned the missions of global surveillance, global movement, or reach, as we call it, and long-range strike. Now, let me simplify that, uh, Slick. It's, it's uh, the ability to watch, to hold at risk, and to destroy, if necessary, any, any object on the planet. So as we were talking about one adversary taking advantage of our distraction, say, with a conflict in uh, the Western Pacific, the Department of Defense is going to have to swing forces to deal with the other distraction. Uh, whether it's uh, a part of the main conflict or if it's some other threat that's trying to take advantage of it. Realistically, the Air Force and Space Force has the unique ability to swing from one side of the globe to the other in very short time frames. So in the threat context Dr. Miller described, the Air Force and Space Force are at the leading edge of options that our nation's leaders require. Absolutely. And, you know, another thing, given what Dr. Miller outlined and, and Stutz, using your experience as a senior Air Force leader, how would you rack and stack our nation's aerospace power uh, or air and space power capabilities? And can you please help our listeners understand the way in which you're working through this assessment? Sure, sure, I can. Uh, from this perspective of being a war planner, oh, we begin with the facts and assumptions of the challenge. Then we look at the means we have, the ways we can use those ships and aircraft and soldiers and Marines and uh, space assets to achieve objectives in the conflict. If I don't have enough stuff, Slick, and ways to address the conflict, that becomes a measure of risk, risk of failure. Vast distances are a factor in the Pacific. We have limited and vulnerable bases that are in the first island chain closest to China, and impressive defenses in China denies access. I assess this and find that we require long-range strike capability that can penetrate close enough to expend munitions on, say, Chinese targets. In China, we might be looking at 10,000 targets, of which we need to strike enough with enough density and quick and quickly enough to have effect. So if we want to impose cost, that's the objective, uh, isn't it? I, I, I need penetrating stealth aircraft, lots of ISR from space and air, and substantial capacity. When your means are short of that, as we see in the Western Pacific scenario over and over again, you begin to size up the risk of actually failing. But do we have enough aerospace power to handle multiple contingencies? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, slick, uh, take China alone. Hundreds of simulations over the past several years of conflict with China you know, they, they, they all point to the same conclusion and, and they reveal the same uh, facts about the Air Force. And we've only got a handful of stealth bombers and a very limited supply of fifth generation stealth fighters uh, to make an impact across those 10,000 or so targets the Air Force would need to strike. By the way, even the mid-tier uh, authoritarian regimes like Iran and North Korea will be high risk because of their ability to target very 
vulnerable air bases slick. And this is a major concern. I think you recall earlier in the year, we had uh, Iran launch a, a salvo, a couple salvos of missiles on two air bases in Iraq. And the impact was stunning. Our overseas bases are all vulnerable. Our adversaries know that. They've equipped themselves accordingly. And as a commander, or I should say as a former commander, I understand this very well, and it would be my number one concern. Well, all that said, sir, if you were to have some time with the incoming Biden defense team, how would you explain air and space's role given this threat environment? Oh, that's a good one, Slick. And uh, boy, it's uh, very important that, um, that those of us who support aerospace power are ready to engage with that because airmen must continually educate our leaders on the values and virtues of air and space power. Uh, and whether they understand it or not, they need to know they will discover serious problems when they realize they don't have enough or it is obsolete against modern anti-access defenses. Finally, Slick, I would, uh, I would encourage them not to make uh, some mistakes of past decision makers. Uh, as a priority, modernizing your aerospace power. Uh, for example, the Next Generation Air Dominance Program is crucial to ensure we can maintain air superiority, not for the sake of the Air and Space Force alone, but over the entire joint force. And the B-21 bomber and F-35 procurement must move faster. We need those fifth generation advanced stealthy platforms. Uh, yes, budgets are gonna be tight in the coming years, I think you know that, Slick. So I would, uh, you know, tell Congress to look across the services to eliminate duplication. You know, the mic drop takeaway is this. Modernize aerospace power and restore capacity to confront tomorrow's threat, not yesterday's. Accelerate that priority or the options across the joint force will be weak. Well, folks, today we explored the broad threat landscape the U.S. faces now and what we think will come our way in the future. This is going to pave the way for future podcast episodes discussing the application of aerospace power. Remember, air and space power represent a set of tools. Their value is derived by solving the broader problems effectively and efficiently. A wise leader once explained to me that the only thing more expensive than a first-rate Air Force was a second-rate one. And I think we hit upon what that means. The price of failure given today's range of threats is severe. We must win, but that's going to demand very careful thinking, planning, and execution. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to Dr. Jim Miller and General Stutzreem for today's discussion and to you, our listeners. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Aerospace Advantage. In the next episode of the Aerospace Advantage podcast, we will commemorate the 30-year anniversary of Desert Storm and talk to the leaders that made crucial decisions night one of the war. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn, or by visiting mitchellaerospacepower.org. Until next time, this is John Slickbaum signing off. Fly safe and check six.